Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome you into the upper room with Jesus and his disciples, as portrayed in Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Leonardo presented this portrait of the last meal of Jesus with his disciples, causing all who see it to become engaged in that very moment. A moment when those who had been closest to him by way of personal conversation and interaction now face the reality of his death through abandonment and ultimately through betrayal. Yet, in the midst of this darkness of heart and fellowship, the viewers can realize the brokenness of humanity's condition. We hope that you will allow yourself to step into this moment of that mealtime where Jesus announced, one of you will betray me. Instantly, the 12 disciples became men of 12 different moods. The only composed one was Jesus. Judas overturns the container of salt while Peter draws his knife. Some disciples stared at Jesus in utter amazement, while some looked at each other in stark disbelief. The disciples will speak in groups of three, followed by a musical presentation for your reflection and connection. When all is complete, a time for sharing in the meal is presented in the cafeteria and an opportunity to meet the cast. So now, let's step into the moment when the Lord's Supper comes to life. My name is James, but since many men bear that familiar name, I am sometimes called James the Little or James the Less, being lesser in size than the other men who bear that name. My father's name was Alphaeus, so sometimes I'm known as James, the son of Alphaeus. Our family is a proud one, tracing its ancestry back to the tribe of Gad, one of the twelve sons of Jacob. I will never forget the day I met the master. I was passing down the road near the place where John was baptizing. I was curious to see what was going on, so I turned aside for a closer look. There, I saw Jesus asking John to baptize him. John refused, but Jesus insisted. After John had baptized the Lord, the heavens opened up, and the Holy Spirit de descended upon him in the form of a dove, and we all heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Later, when Jesus called me to be one of his disciples, I followed him. So at the end of the first year of his public ministries, I became one of his twelve apostles. And since then, I have walked and talked alongside him. I have stayed and prayed at his side, trying to learn as much about him and his heavenly Father as I could. And now one of us is to betray him. Surely it is madness to think that this could be. Surely this traitor is out of his mind. Yet I keep asking myself, is it I? Is it I? Like Zacchaeus, I am a tax collector. Some call me Levi, while others... Call me Matthew, the publican. While my character changed throughout my fellowship with Jesus, he changed my name as well. He called on me one day when I was in my office collecting taxes. Follow me, he said, and I rose and followed him. Later, I gave him a great feast in my home, and many of his disciples and my business friends were present. It was a royal occasion for me to entertain Jesus and his disciples. When some of the Pharisees complained about Jesus eating with publicans and sinners, Jesus said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And he reminded them of the words of Hosea, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, adding these significant words of his own, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. From that day on, when I repented and followed him, I have studied our scriptures closely and am convinced Jesus is the fulfillment of every prophecy about the coming Messiah, God's anointed. 
I have listened to his sermons carefully. I hope to one day write a paper proving that he is the Messiah. From our words of our holy scriptures and recording the heart of his sermon about the good news of the kingdom of God. A sermon he first delivered on a mountain in Galilee three years ago. It will be a new gospel. Good news for all the world. And yet, he has just given us bad news. Tragic news. That one of us would betray him? Well, who could it be? Will they suspect me? Because I was once a hated tax collector? Do I suspect myself? Is it I? Is it I? My name is Nathaniel, although sometimes I'm called Bartholomew. Like many of these others, I am a fisherman. My home is in Cana of Galilee, where Jesus performed his first public miracle, turning water into wine at a wedding feast. I was a disciple of John the Baptizer. It was John who introduced me to Jesus at Bethany beyond the Jordan. It was my friend Philip who came to me and said, we have found him of whom Moses in the Law and the Prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. I'll never forget the question I put to Philip that day. Can anything good, Philip, come from Nazareth? I said it not because Nazareth had a bad reputation. It's such a small, insignificant place. Those of us familiar with her lanes and alleys wondered, why would God place his anointed in her midst? Philip simply replied, Come and see. When Jesus saw me, he said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. How do you know me, I asked. He said, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. In my country, when working mothers go into the field, they place their little babies under the shade of a nearby fig tree. The large leaves shelter the babies from the hot rays of the sun. So the master was actually telling me he had known me since the day I was born. That's when I confessed my faith. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. From that time on, I served him as a disciple and as a chosen apostle. And together with these others, we've traveled through the villages of Galilee and the towns of the Decapolis and the streets of the holy city, Jerusalem. And now, when he's instituting a ceremony that's to replace the Passover, he tells us one of us is going to betray him. How can this be? How can a traitor be numbered among his closest friends? I keep asking myself, is it I? Is it I? Thank you. 
I'm James, the brother of John. I followed Jesus with my brother after he called us while we were mending our nets by the Sea of Galilee with my father Zebedee one day, almost three years ago. And we were honored when Jesus wanted us as apostles. I was present in Peter's home when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. And later I was with him in the home of Jairus when Jesus raised his little daughter from the sleep of death. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, we saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. Our mother, Salome, was quite ambitious on our behalf, and she urged us to press our claims on him. So, en route to Jerusalem last week, we made this request of him. Teacher, grant us to sit, one at your right, and the other at your left when you come into your kingdom. He replied, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? We answered him, Lord, we are able. He then assured us that we would surely drink his cup and be baptized with his baptism. But it was not in his power to grant the right and privilege of sitting at his right and left hand in his father's kingdom. Now, the others, they were quite upset when they heard of our request. But then Jesus reminded us that he who would be first must be the servant of all. And he demonstrated his words by washing our feet just before supper. Once, when people from a certain Samaritan village didn't receive Jesus as we thought they should, we asked Jesus to call down fire from heaven to destroy them. He rebuked us as only he could. And he reminded us that God's way was always one of love. And now, he who taught us the way of love is to be betrayed by one of those whom he loved. Who can it be? Why should one of us do such a thing? I keep thinking deep down inside my own heart. Is it I? Is it I? I am Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter the man who first brought his own brother to the Lord. I am not a gifted man. I'm just an ordinary, average man like any one of you. But I have tried to do what I could to serve the Master with the gifts and talents that I have. The others call me Andrew, the bringer, because it seems that all I have ever done is bring someone else to Jesus. I brought my brother Peter to Jesus and have gloried in the gradual transformation in his life. Then later, I found the young lad with the five loaves and two fish the day that Jesus fed the 5,000. And as I watched him feed so many with so little, and as I watched them all eat until they were full, I was glad in my heart that I had found the lad and brought him to the Lord. Then, recently, some Greeks came searching for the Master, and once again I was called in to bring the Greeks to Jesus. He must have saw something in me of value that the others overlooked, because he called me to be one of the twelve apostles. I have been close to my Master ever since. We have shared in many triumphs and in many tragedies. I know in my heart that he is truly the Lamb of God. I may not have been in the inner circle like Peter, but I have not been in the outer circle either. I am a friend and companion to my Lord. What greater gift could life afford a fisherman? And now one of us is to betray him. It's unthinkable. Who could it be? How could it be? How could anyone get away with it in their own heart? Could it be Andrew, the bringer? Is it I? Is it I? I am Thomas the twin. 
or Thomas called Didymus, which means twin. While I do not look upon life with gloom and despondency, I usually demand proof before I believe. I want to see before committing myself, yet I am not a man of doubt. I rather see myself as a man of daring. I recall the day when Mary and Martha sent word to the Lord that their brother Lazarus was dead. Jesus turned to us and said, let's go to him. We knew of the growing opposition to Jesus. Some of the apostles did not want to go to Bethany. They shrank from the unseen danger. Yet, I remember how I spoke out and rebuked them by saying, let's go to him so that we may die with him. Why do people remember my doubt? Forget my daring. Remember Remember the, the questions and forget the, the and forget why do they remember my fear and forget my faith? I used to go fishing with some of the others and how well I remember the Beatitudes he spoke on the horns of Hattin during the first year of his public ministry. And I can almost see him hearing the winds rebuking the winds on stormy Galilee as he healed the sick, cured the disease, opened the eyes of the blind, unstopped the ears of the deaf, cleansed the lepers, and preached the gospel to the poor. Yet, opposition has developed and grown to white heat. His enemies are determined to destroy him. Why? Because the God he reveals is a greater God than the petty little man-made deities he has enthroned on the heats and altars of their heats and temples. He would bring us all up to God while his enemies would cut down, God down to their size. He would make us God's servants while they would make God their servants. And now, he says that even among us, the chosen 12, there is a traitor. Is he speaking of me? Is it I? Is it I?
all these others, <laughs> they're Galilean. But my home is in the village of Keroth in Judea. So I'm known as Judas of Keroth or Judas Iscariot, the only Judean in this group. And yet they must have had confidence in me because they chose me to be their treasure. And Jesus must have believed in me because he chose me to be one of the twelve. Now, despite what the others say behind my back about my impatience and stinginess and self-ambition, he believed in me. If he didn't, he would have chosen someone in my place. Now, some say that I have acquired these funds for my own personal use, and that Jesus was speaking personally to me when he talked about greed and the love of money. Still others remind me that Jesus was speaking about me directly when he said, Have I not chosen you twelve, but one of you is a devil? Sure, I got mad when Mary poured the expensive perfume and ointment on Jesus' feet. I still think it was a waste of money. And if I conspired with the chief priests, and I have 30 pieces of silver on my person, well, well, that's my affair. I believe in Jesus, but someone had to force the issue, make him assert himself as God's Messiah. He refused to make a move, so I made one. Now he hints that he knows what I've done. He said so a few moments ago when he washed my feet and when we dipped our bread into the same dish. But my soul is not as black as what you may think, nor is your soul so white. And what would you do if you were in my place and you wanted him to do something dramatic and spectacular to call forth his kingdom? What would you do? And what would you do if you were in Jesus' place? <laughs> what would you do? Now, should I respond to his statement? Or should I respond the way of these Galileans, piously and self-righteously, saying, Is it I? Is it I? I am Thaddeus, one of the disciples whom Jesus called to be an apostle. You see, the twelve tribes of Israel took their names from the ten sons of Jacob, who was renamed Israel, and from two of the sons of Jacob's favorite son, Joseph, who were named Ephraim and Manasseh. In like manner, Jesus chose twelve of us to be the cornerstone of the new kingdom, just as the 12 tribes were the cornerstones of the old Jewish kingdom. I find myself unworthy to be numbered among the apostles, but he selected me. I remember the day. And later on, it was after a prayer at night he called us to him, and he gave us authority over unclean spirits and the power to heal every kind of disease and infirmity. And then he commissioned us to go forth and preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. He told us to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves since he was sending us forth like sheep in the midst of wolves. It is enough, he said, that the disciple be like the teacher and a servant like his master. I was in Jerusalem when he gave the great invitation. He said, come to me, all you that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, 
and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. And now, he who came to save man has a burden thrust upon him. The knowledge that one of us will betray him? Oh, which one of us can this be? Who, who is this traitor? Is it the man we least suspect? Or will we all betray him before the night is over? Philip and Peter and Judas and even Thaddeus? Is it I? Is it I? Oh. My name, <clears throat> my name is Philip. I come from Bethsaida in Galilee. While several of my friends and I were in Bethany listening to John the Baptist, Jesus called us to be his disciples. We all turned to follow him. I went after my companion, Nathaniel, and was overjoyed when Jesus accepted him as a devout follower. Through the years of close fellowship with Jesus, my faith in God has grown stronger and deeper. I remember well before he fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, saying to him and the others, where are we to buy bread that all of these may eat? Little did I know that Andrew was already bringing a young lad and his lunch to Jesus. When the Greeks came to me and wanted an interview with the master, I turned them over to Andrew and he brought them to Jesus. I have always wanted to have a better understanding of the nature and person of God. Now when Jesus began to tell us that God is our Heavenly Father, it was almost beyond my understanding. However, as I have listened to the Master, I have grown to understand His words. In fact, I can almost say, He who has seen Jesus has seen the Father. Because everything that one would want to find in the Father I find in Jesus, and, and nothing that I do not want to find in the Father do I find in the Son. And now that we have seen the Father through him, he shocks us by telling us there is a betrayer in our midst. Does the traitor not realize that to betray Jesus is to betray God? That, that to conspire against Jesus is to conspire against God. Who among our number could be so blind? Who could it be? Could it, could it be Philip? Is it I? Is it I? How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he 
After Jesus called Peter and Andrew to follow him, he came to me, John, and my brother James. We were in a boat nearby with our father, Zebedee, mending our nets. When he called us, we immediately left the boat and our father and followed him. Since that time, I have tried to understand Jesus by loving him. Sometimes I believe that he is as much of God as will ever possess a human life. Yet, at times I am tempted to believe that he is the God who existed prior to creation and will continue to exist after the end times and the consummation of the age. That he is the world that God would speak to every person in every age for all time to come. Yet, I love him as a person, and he has returned my love. Sometimes he calls me the beloved disciple. I have shared his trials as well as his hours of victory. I was there on the Mount of Transfiguration, and we beheld his glory. He nicknamed James and me the Sons of Thunder. Yet, we are not boisterous men, but quiet, hard workers. Although, at times we may be a bit impatient with those who reject Jesus. Peter and I completed the arrangements for the celebration of the Passover in the upper room here tonight because he numbers us within his close, intimate inner circle. For it was to me that he spoke those wonderful words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Someday I want to write down some of his sayings and some of his many wonderful deeds, so that others may read them and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing they may have life in his name. Yet he has just said one of us was a betrayer. I cannot believe it. Yet it must be so, else he would not have said it. Who could it be? Surely not my brother or... Peter or Andrew? Could it be John, the beloved disciple? Is it I? Is it I? I'm Simon. Simon the Zealot. Simon Zelotes. Before Jesus called me to be one of his disciples, I was part of a band of hot-headed, bloodthirsty revolutionaries. And we believed in armed revolt against Rome. We believed that we could crush the heads of our enemies, and we could there, after that we could reestablish the kingdom, the glory that was Israel back in the days of King David and King Solomon. But then, Jesus came along, and he told us about a different kind of kingdom. He told us about the kingdom in the human heart, when God reigns there supremely. And since then, I, I've changed my thinking. I've changed my allegiance, since he has taught me that the conquest of the heart is the only true and sincere and lasting conquest. And so, I have surrendered to him, I have given him my highest loyalty and my deepest devotion. You could say in military terms that I have unconditionally, completely surrendered my life to him, to think his thoughts, to love as he loves and whom he loves, to obey as he obeys and to serve as he serves. And, and this surrender, this surrender has not resulted in imprisonment. Rather, for the first time in my life, I am completely free. I believe that with God's help, we can overcome these Romans. We can outlive them and outlove them in the name of God, whom Jesus has revealed to us. Yes, Jesus whom we call our Savior and our Lord. But now the Master tells us that there is a spiritual Roman seated at this table, one who would seek to accomplish by force what can really only be done by love. Who could that be? Is it Matthew the publican? Is it the big fisherman, or maybe his brother Andrew? Or 
does Jesus suspect me? After all, I am the only former zealot in the group. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? My brother Andrew and I were out fishing on the Sea of Galilee one afternoon, casting our nets into the sea. When Jesus walked by, he said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We immediately dropped our nets, and we followed him. Later, he would even use our boat as a wayside pulpit from which to speak to the great multitudes that followed him. One morning, he said, Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. I replied, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing, but at your word, I will let down my nets. We caught so many fish that we had to summon other nearby boats in order to contain the catch. When we got back to shore, I fell at his feet and I cried out, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. But he told us that thereafter, he would make us fishers of men. He even changed my name from Simon to Peter, which means the rock. And when I confessed him as the Christ, the son of the living God, near Caesarea Philippi, he said, on this rock will I build my church. But a moment later, when I protested his going to Jerusalem to suffer death at the hands of evil men, he rebuked me and said, get behind me, Satan. So I'm a mixture of good and evil, of godliness and devilishness. But I want to prove to him that my love, loyalty, and devotion are sincere and genuine. Tonight when he said that one of us would betray him, I promised that I would follow him even unto death. But he told me that before the rooster crows twice, I will have denied him three times. He prayed for me because he said that Satan wants me so that he could sift me like wheat. Even though the others call me the big fisherman, in his presence, I feel small and unworthy. Will I deny him tonight before the rooster crows? If I do, what will he do? Will he disown me? Will he deny me? Will he close the doors of his kingdom to me? Was he referring to me when he said, one of you will betray me? If I knew who the scoundrel was, I'd pierce his heart with this knife I hold in my hand. But maybe it would be my own heart that I would pierce. God grant it not be so. But I keep wondering and asking myself, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far
spending time with each other in this presentation. We know how the story ends. Most people, no matter what their religious background, know it comes to Jesus being crucified on the cross and a few days later, stepping out of his tomb into resurrection power and presence. Tonight, we ask you to consider, perhaps for the first time, your role in these events and all that is offered through Jesus. Now we will have some music. The ushers will help you leave here in an orderly fashion for safety and the opportunity to go to a place where you can partake of the meal of Jesus if you would like. Otherwise, you can go meet with the actors and share any words and thanks with them. There's a box by the door going out for any financial support you may wish to give for deferring the cost in presenting the Living Lord's Supper to you. Again, we thank you for coming and offering a special thanks to Joel and his crew for sound and lighting, along with McCray Schools for the use of this auditorium and cafeteria. Trumpet sound. 